Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello and welcome to episode 65 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Thanks for listening. If you remember episode 64 from last week, I was frustrated, uh, upset, and probably a little bit anxious about the procrastination. In this episode, uh, in my personal update, you're going to hear about how that came to finally bite me in the butt. And uh, I'm also going to share in this episode a article that I recently had published in Write Magazine. It's going to be another short episode, um, but I thought it'd be something you'd want to get to soon. First, a quick word about our sponsor. If you've been paying attention to the book industry news, you might have noticed that this week, BookBub, one of the premier spots for promoting your books, has announced Chirp, a new way to promote audiobooks. And there haven't been many ways to promote audiobooks, particularly because the gorilla in the room, the uh, Audible, which is the market that uh, many people think is the only audiobook market, but is far from it, uh, doesn't allow control of price. But every other market in the industry, pretty much every other market in the industry does, and the only way you can get that uh, is using uh, find-away voices. I should say, not the only way, but the best way, uh, in my humble opinion, of getting your books into all of those markets and controlling the prices is find-away. Uh, and find-away voices is the sponsor for this podcast. And it looks like find-away has partnered, uh, as of this announcement that came out uh, by Katie Donlan uh, from BookBub, on the BookBub blog on March 5th, 2019. And so Chirp is... Uh, a new partnership uh, with Findaway Voices, and it is basically to uh, resolve the requests from readers and partners for new ways to discover and promote audiobooks. Uh, as one of the leading platforms for book discovery and promotion, BookBub was very interested in coming up with a service called Chirp, and it offers uh, consumers a selection of limited-time audiobook deals every day that they can purchase a la carte directly from the site. Uh, the deals are supplied by authors and publishers, and they're curated by the same team at BookBub editors who are behind the featured deals at BookBub. So right now they're a supported retailer at Finoway, and this is a company that obviously provides audiobook distribution services to the industry, and authors can sign up for the Chirp waiting list, and there'll be a link in the show notes for starkreflections.ca to find out more about how that's going to work. And if you're interested in how you can use Find Away Voices and explore that as an author, you can check it out at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. As I mentioned last week, I was speaking a bit about procrastination. I was in Vegas for a conference a writer's workshop, a Fiction River Anthology workshop, and I was bemoaning the fact that I had procrastinated and uh, had been scrambling to get all of the stories read for this. And um, in response to last week's episode, had this uh, great um, post um, from Isabel Peterson. And in her uh, comment on the show notes at starkreflections.ca, Isabel said, Procrastination has been a big problem. I found a fellow author in my genre and we're each other's accountability partner. We've developed a schedule, but it did take a little while. We now start our day with a phone call while we walk our dogs in the morning at 9.30 a.m. We chit-chat and then establish our goals for the day, be it word count, plotting, or what have you. We may also talk about some of the plotting issues we're having. Then we agree on how many writing sprints we're going to do, usually three or four, 20 to 30 minutes each, usually 11, 12.30, 2, and maybe 4 o'clock, depending on kids' schedules. We send a text on our agreed time slots and then report in after the block. It's made a world of difference from often getting no words done to averaging 4 to 5k a day. Knowing someone else is depending on me has been huge. Quite the game changer and I've made an amazing friend to boot. Well thank you so much Isabel for that 
wonderful and insightful comment. I had asked for people to share uh, thoughts on on overcoming procrastination, and I love that accountability partner. I love the fact that you're both helping each other out, that you have similar schedules, and you can uh, kind of count on on uh, being held accountable uh, to one another. It's amazing that you're aver- actually averaging four to five thousand words a day. That is absolutely incredible. And I love that you shared that. Thanks for sharing that here. I'm sharing it with listeners who may not uh, read the comments uh, because maybe there are listeners out there like me who need some help and support with procrastination. And and so maybe that is a great way to uh, hold yourself accountable. I do know that when I sign up for NaNoWriMo, I feel like I'm publicly accountable and I find uh, I'm a little bit more uh, on the ball uh, with getting things done. Although with NaNoWriMo, I usually start off really, really well in the first four or five days. Then I let it peter off. And then usually in the last couple of weeks I go, or maybe the last week is when I really go to town. Again, the procrastination monster uh, comes, the panic monster uh, comes and sets in. But thanks, Isabel, uh, for sharing that. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, any other comments that people have on procrastination, feel free to leave them here on episode 65 or on episode 64. But I'm now going to get to a little bit of a personal update related to uh, that thing last week. And, and just a quick rehash of last week's episode. I was in Vegas at the Fiction River Anthology Workshop, where I'm, uh, I guess, the third of the of the continuing editors with uh, Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush. They've got me, I don't, Lord knows why they chose me, but uh, bless them for uh, for having the faith in me. But I'm, I'm the third editor. They're um, Charles Nelson Riley, if you will, uh, who's uh, center square. Uh, who returns uh, for both their uh, masterclass workshops in the fall, as well as the anthology workshops. And and they switch out uh, the other editors uh, that come and go. Uh, Denise Little was there uh, last year, and uh, Dale Dermatis uh, and Leah Cutter were the other uh, guest editors. And then there'll be uh, additional uh, editors coming uh, next year. Uh, Ron Collins and Bridget Collins, uh, father and daughter team, actually. Great writers of their own right as well. Um, as well as Annie Reed, who has been a long time uh, writing participant in the workshops, and and she joined us on on stage one day to share some of her thoughts, and so we're bringing her back uh, for next year. So that'll be a lot of fun. But as I was explaining in episode sixty four, I had uh, it was actually a one point three million words. I think I, I misestimated it at one point five. So my apologies for for adding two hundred thousand words there. But it was one point three million words. Of stories, and so there were um, some anthologies, and so I I actually had two of them. I had uh, day one uh, was my anthology um, obsessions in the fiction uh, river theme, and then I also had uh, a, a, a special uh, issue of Pulp House that I was guest editing, and the theme was art, literature, music, and culture, uh, and so that was my that was going to be the the last one. So I was doing those two, and Leo was doing uh, the theme of explorers for Fiction River. And Adele was doing the theme of secrets. And Chris was doing um, three different um, sort of mini uh, anthologies uh, on the Christmas theme. One was Bloody Christmas. The other one was Joyous Christmas. And uh, the third one was Christmas Traditions. Um, and, and they're all uh, going to be released in a very special way um, that uh, she'll be sharing. But what we had done was I was opening up the first day and about three quarters of the first day was uh, dedicated for my first anthology. So that's where all the editors go through and we've all read the stories and they comment. And then I'm the final editor to comment and then I decide if I'm buying the story or not. Uh, and if if I buy the story, the writer gets um, a contract from um, WMG Publishing for uh, first rights for the story. They get six cents US a word. And then uh, usually about six months after publication, the author, uh, the rights revert back to the author. If Fiction River wants to republish it again, they then pay the author again, uh, which is which is pretty cool. So on the first day, I was uh, doing uh, Obsessions. And then Leah started sort of for the last hour, um, her uh, Explorers. And then uh, the second day was to be uh, finishing off Explorers. And then Chris was going to start in on the first of her anthology. So I had read, uh, before the workshop started, I had finished both of my anthologies because I put those first because I needed to spend the most time thinking about them. 
Uh, and then I had just uh, before, uh, the day before the anthology workshop started, I had finished Leah's book and I just started on Chris's uh, three anthologies. And and in the guise of um, a good procrastinator uh, or a pro procrastinator, I should say, I looked at Chris's anthologies and the order was um, Bloody, uh, Christmas, and Joyous Christmas, which is, uh, you know, it's obviously murder mystery Christmas stories. And then uh, Joyous Christmas was romance Christmas stories. And the third one was traditions where she wanted to see different styles of uh, traditions, not necessarily Christmas, but that season. So it could be different holidays, different cultures, etc. Uh, different approaches to it. And so as a professional, well-practiced procrastinator, knowing the order that Chris was doing them in, I thought, okay, I, I'm not going to get them all done. Uh, I will get the first uh, anthology done. So I, I got the bloody Christmas one finished so that when we finished Leah's uh, stuff on the second day and started into Chris's, I would be ready to go. And then that night when we finished, I could read the stories for the next two anthologies. And I would be, uh, as I always was, just catching up, just, uh, just in time, just getting everything done. Of course, Chris had uh, a thing she wanted to do. Uh, and again, these are lessons uh, with a live group of writers in the audience to demonstrate the different approaches that editors take when they're selecting. And so Chris wanted to demonstrate it, doing it from um, the last one first and going forward. So she wanted to start by talking about traditions, then move into joyous, then move into bloody. At which point, I'm on stage, I find out as we're going live that uh, we're doing one of the two I haven't read yet. And of course, I had to. This is the first time I'd actually been caught with my pants down. And I had to admit in front of the entire audience what I had done and how I had planned this. Uh, I, they knew I was a procrastinator, but maybe not to the extent of, of my procrastination, but I basically had to admit that I couldn't talk about these stories because I hadn't yet read them. It was an extremely embarrass embarrassing uh, moment for me, uh, although I will always admit to when I'm wrong, and uh, which is very often, so it's pretty easy to get used to it. But I admitted to that. Um, I was very apologetic to both the writers as well as to uh, you know Chris and Dean and and the other editors there. Uh, they were very um, they they were very understanding and supportive. And of course, uh, that was only for the first five or six stories um, because then we we ended it for the night, and then I got a chance to to go and read the rest of them, and and I was back on track for the rest of the workshop. With, of course, the one exception, and you may be able to hear it a little bit in my voice, is on the Saturday morning um, in Vegas, uh, we had uh, put together a team, a running team called the Anthology Antelopes, and it was part of the uh, 5K charity run called Runaway with Cirque du Soleil. And uh, Chris is a runner, and uh, Dean started running as well. Uh, since they moved to Vegas, he's uh, joined her in running. And uh, let's see, uh, Juliet and Michelle and Stephanie and Dave and uh, Patrick and Alexi and uh, Kate. Uh, and, and there's, there's uh, other, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting, that there were a few uh, other runners there. And we all uh, went running on the Saturday morning. And again, it was Vegas, so it's way warmer than where I'm from in Ontario, Canada. Um, and so I was there in shorts and in my cutoff shirt and ready to go. It did end up raining, uh, got a bit of a chill. And I think a combination of the lack of sleep as I had been staying up late to read for the, these anthologies last minute as I do, combined with the, the wet and the cold um, uh, that morning. And I think that weakened my immune system. And I came down with what felt like a uh, a really, really nasty flu or cold. I actually had not felt that bad since the time I was uh, diagnosed. Uh, I was wondering why I was feeling so bad. And my doctor had done x-rays and he says, well, it's because you have pneumonia in both lungs. That's why. Uh, and I said, oh, wow, it's a good thing I work at a desk. He's like, no, you're not going into work. You're going to be in bed for two weeks. 
Um, at which point I think it was the day after that I actually collapsed and I couldn't get up and I couldn't get out of bed actually. And the fever was so bad. And that first day, uh, when this hit me, uh, I'm in this hotel room in Vegas and I actually had to contact uh, Chris and Dean and the other editors and say, I don't think I can get out of bed today. So I actually missed one full day of the workshop, which was really upsetting because, you know, I had stories to talk about by that point. Um, but that was, um, that hit me. And, and I slowly got better um, because the, ne- the very next day I was back on stage again. Um, uh, you know, we were finishing up one of the other anthologies and, and I had to do my second one, um, which was really, really hard because it t- does take a lot of energy uh, out of me when I'm on stage and I'm, and I'm having to provide feedback uh, to the authors. Because again, uh, my, my feedback c- consists of, I have a spreadsheet of information with the story title, etc., and then I just leave a, a bullet point uh, in in the spreadsheet uh, for the writer. And then as as the you know we we talk okay that's this story by this writer. And then and then somebody reads a very brief summary of what the story is about. And then I have to go back and and remember. And unfortunately, it was not having to go back that long because I only read them in the last few weeks. Um, some some of them, of course, uh, in in the last day or two. Um, I'd have to go back, think about what the story was, look at my notes. How does that, how do these point uh, bullet point notes make sense with what I have to say? And then come up with something that can be useful, constructive, uh, f- for the, for the writer. And in terms of what did I like about the story? What did I find a challenge? What didn't I like, etc. So that, that can actually be pretty draining. And so by the time I left the workshops, I, uh, and, and this is interesting for me because I'm a huge craft beer lover. On the Thursday that I got to Vegas, I'd spent the afternoon with them, you know some of the stories loaded onto a Kobo. I was at a, a wonderful bar called Eureka, which is a great craft beer bar on uh, Fremont Street, uh, sort of just beyond the main attractions on Fremont Street. It is a wonderful spot, and they had some great beers. I sat there for the afternoon, had some beers, had some lunch. And, and finished reading uh, for one of the anthologies. And because every night I was uh, back reading and then I got sick, I didn't end up going out and enjoying the wonderful craft beer scene and, and Banger Brewing, which is right on Fremont Street as well. And, and that was really disappointing. But I guess a karmic reward for me that I didn't get a chance to uh, hang out with some of the writers who wanted to buy me a beer, which is always appreciated and fun, um, and even just to get to chat with them and hang out. I didn't get that opportunity. So uh, the the procrastination effect this time uh, bit me in the butt, and uh, it was quite embarrassing. It was uh, humiliating uh, in many ways, and has taught me a, a lesson that uh, for this particular workshop, at least, I'm going to start reading the stories uh, so that they're done early, and I'm finished reading them well before the anthology workshop, so that when I get there, all I have to do is maybe review them, uh, because again, I'm used to having just recently read them, and I think maybe it'll be more useful if, if, I, if I read it a month earlier, uh, that if I can't remember the story, that maybe says something about it, or if I can remember the story, that says something about it, but then that'll give me the opportunity to actually relax and enjoy being there with Chris and Dean and the authors and and some of the fun things I can do when I'm in town. So that's one of the lessons that I learned. And, and of course, I'm, I'm still uh, getting over uh, the, 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 the flu, the cold uh, that hit me. It's still in my voice. I'm sure you can hear it. And I'm hoping that it goes away because Liz and I are going away on a fun tropical vacation in just a few days. And I don't want to be suffering from this sort of hacking cough. I want to be able to enjoy the fun in the sun. But that's it for my personal update for this week. Uh, It was a long one. Uh, This is going to be a relatively short episode because all I'm going to do right now is read to you from a recent article that I had published. This is an article that appeared in um, Write Magazine, which is a magazine published by the Writers Union of Canada. It was their winter 2019 edition. And it's an article they asked me to write uh, regarding the choices that I've made in terms of publishing. Two publishing paths diverged in a digital world. A stark look at self-publishing by Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Self-publishing is the best way to kill your writing career. I let those 
harsh words spoken by a respected fellow writer who was earning a living as a full-time writer hang in the air. But, I wanted to say, except I knew better. I'd been a bookseller since 1992 and had seen plenty of crappy, unedited, terribly designed self-published books. Despite loving books in all shapes, sizes, and guises, I had a difficult time scraping together any affection for the many self-published books that had been pitched to me. They usually stood out like that mutt in the litter of beautiful frolicking puppies, or that kid with a thick line of snot trailing down his lip from his nostril, making you want to look away. I nodded. This trusted mentor wanted to prevent me from being cast in that same unholy light. He'd watched me slowly claw my way out of magazine slush piles, first earning contributor copies, then minimal cash payments, and finally the pro rate of five to six cents per word for my stories. A dozen other writers offered similar advice, but I did it anyway. That was in 2004, when you'd be as likely to admit to self-publishing as you would to masturbating. To hide my shame, I crafted the Stark Publishing imprint, Stark wasn't just a great word considering the raw, bare, and sharp DIY ethic, but it was derived from Stark Entertainment, the DJ service company my best friend Steve and I ran in our university days. Steve plus Mark equals Stark. Despite the advice of friends who wanted to protect me from embarrassing myself like poor little snot-faced Johnny, I felt justified in publishing a collection of mostly previously published stories. Different editors had already selected them for magazines, so the stories had already fought their way through legitimate publishing gatekeepers. One Hand Screaming was released in October 2004. That experiment in self-publishing was like a Lay's potato chip for me. I couldn't have just one. I had opened my mind to the possibilities that now existed via new publishing technologies. Not even 15 years after that first book, I now have more than 20 books out from different publishers and my own imprint. The count is higher if you include digital-only titles, because a book doesn't have to be defined as 300 pages bound between two pieces of cloth. And an author doesn't have to limit their fate to a business model that consists mostly of agents and publishers trying to sell a book to a chain bookstore buyer in New York or Toronto on a four-season buying cycle. It's not about rejection. It's about control. When done properly, the only self in self-publishing is self-directed. Successful authors are hiring editors, designers, and marketing experts, just like a publisher. Running Kobo Writing Life, Kobo's free self-publishing platform, I've seen hundreds of authors earning five, six, and seven-figure incomes from their ebook sales alone, and many others who've been able to write full-time. That's something that's almost impossible for most traditional only published midlist authors whose declining incomes are negatively impacted by smaller advances and domino-like publishing mergers. Embracing both traditional and self-publishing options has doubled my income. Approximately 90% of my traditional publishing revenue comes from print sales and roughly 75% of my self-publishing revenue comes from ebook sales. I get paid for my publishers twice annually My self-publishing income comes monthly, directly into my bank account from Amazon, Kobo, and Draft2Digital. In the fall of 2017, I left my high-paying corporate job to write full-time and to independently assist authors in their own journeys via my podcast and consulting, including that dear author friend who sincerely wanted to help me by warning what I was getting into. He was right, back then, but things change. I have helped him sell more copies of a hybrid title published internationally than he made from the same title in domestic traditional publishing sales. 70% of a $599 ebook, $4.19, versus 12% of a $1499 ebook, $1.80. Combine the larger margin with a higher volume of sales, and you can see why more writers who embrace the hybrid publishing model can earn a respectable living. The truth is, there's no single publishing solution. Each book project is as unique as you, the author. To riff off Robert Frost, two publishing paths stand before you. You can choose both. 
I have, being open to the possibilities, has made all the difference. I think it's important that this article appeared in uh, Wright Magazine, and I really appreciate John Deegan, uh, Executive Director, who would reached out and asked that I write uh, an article uh, like that. Because uh, the um, Writers' Union of Canada is very much uh, an organization that's fighting for the rights of writers, and uh, it's actually an organization that I really should uh, join. Uh, I'm planning on becoming a member. I think uh, 2019 is the year I should uh, I should join. I got my act together. I think uh, enough to do this. Um, but in this article, uh, I mean, there's a, an article uh, uh, from John uh, about getting your rights back and the importance of fair contracts in terms of contracts should not be forever, like the 10 principles for fair contracts. Authors should uh, share in the success of their creation. Authors' copyright should be respected, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's some other uh, great articles uh, in this particular issue that, that are basically a publisher scorecard and a really good look at... Um, uh, the good, the bad, and the disappointing. Uh, it's a survey uh, based on uh, the major publishers in Canada and in terms of um, contract negotiation and editing and uh, design and layout and marketing pr- promotion, the things that they offer. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, the advances they're offering. So you can actually see that, you know, the most common advance range for Canadian uh, publisher, the most common is between $1,000 and $4,999, uh, which is kind of interesting. There are, there are advances that go higher. Uh, those tend to be the exceptions, uh, and, they're, and they're a bit rare. Um, there, there's a good number of them, actually, that are uh, in, the, in the lower range, too. Um, but this is interesting to see uh, where the advances are, where the contracts are, uh, as well as some of the other articles, um, you know, about that. So I think it's kind of important that this article appears in this magazine. And, and my impression of the, the Writers' Union of Canada is that the majority of the members are ones who uh, intimately understand traditional publishing, and they understand that really, really well. Um, but they may not be as familiar with self-publishing. So the article uh, does seem like uh, an introduction to self-publishing. Uh, but again, if you think, uh, when you realize that the audience is most likely people who, like myself, were raised in traditional publishing, I had to first overcome a bias I had as a bookseller, having had people pitch self-published titles to me. And yes, I'd had a lot of really disgusting, horrible, terrible uh, books pitched to me uh, as a bookseller. Um, the, the really well done ones were the exception. And uh, Terry Fallis, uh, who's a good friend of mine now, um, was um, when I was uh, the book manager at the McMaster University bookstore, and he was a, um, a graduate, a former graduate from McMaster, who had self published his very first book, The Best Laid Plans. That was the one of the first times I remember. Um, seeing a self-published book and going, whoa, this is awesome. We have to carry this. Uh, and it was actually sincere in that. I, uh, I ordered 30 copies non-returnable. They were orderable through Ingram and they were fully non-returnable, but I didn't care because I knew I was going to be able to sell them. And of course he won the Stephen Leacock Award and, and you know, those 30 copies are probably worth a lot more now and I have one signed. So uh, again, I had to overcome my biases um, because I was raised in traditional publishing. And so I approached that article from the point of view to, to try and help writers understand that there's more than one way of doing things. That, uh, yeah, uh, and, and again, I was talking about um, the Fiction River Anthology Workshop. That is more like traditional publishing because uh, Dean and Chris, even though they are, uh, you know, uh, supporters of, of indie authors, uh, this is their publishing company, WMG Publishing, but they are paying writers for their works, but they're very fair contracts. And so it gives the writers the opportunity to have their uh, work sold professionally. And, and, and I've uh, got the opportunity to witness many writers uh, over my uh, years uh, doing these workshops as an editor um, have their very first professional sale there. And, and what, a, what an honor to be a part of that process. That Because um, I remember my, my first professional sale. Julie Trinata was the acquiring editor of an anthology. And, and I remember where I was when, when I met her in person to to sign uh, to sign that contract. My dad was actually with me. Uh, it was a special moment I'll always remember because that was my very first professional sale. Uh, it was pretty exciting. 
Um, and so it's always exciting when, when that can, and when you can be a part of that. Uh, but again, uh, Dean and Chris also help teach writers what they can do themselves, uh, with them, you know, so can, can you release this short story, uh, on your own and you can use places like bundle rabbit to do that as well. So yes, yes, you can get professional rights and sell it to a market. You can sell it to, you know, a magazine or an anthology, and then you can resell it or you can collect it together like I had done in one hand screaming uh, and make that available again. Again, there's no single path. There's no single solution. There's no single way for you to make this work. Um, being open to the possibilities is critical. Well, that's it for episode 65 of the Stark Reflections podcast. I hope you enjoyed my stark and startling revelation of what happens when procrastination bites you in the butt. I hope it doesn't bite you in the butt. I hope maybe you learn from my lesson, and maybe that's a softer way uh, of learning from that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the article as well. Thanks for joining me in this episode of the podcast. Thank you to all the patrons who support this podcast over on patreon.com patreon.com slash stark reflections. I do appreciate your monthly support that shows that you care enough about the show that you want to support it financially. And I do encourage you guys to do send me questions that I can uh, directly answer to you or uh, include uh, in episodes as well. So thanks for joining me in episode 65. I hope you are doing well. I hope you've avoided the flu, unlike me. And uh, I look forward to hanging out with you again next week. So until next week, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.